take it away, Jill. Welcome everyone. I wanted to share with you our collective agreement. <clears throat> Before we begin, inspired by the presenters of Black Reconstructions, Cities and Spatial Justice, a recent event at the Museum of Modern Art, we have prepared a collective, a collective agreement for engaging with our invited guests at the symposium. We will recognize others' right to speak from experience and make space for the voice of others. We will practice engaged listening as an act of care. We will not tolerate abuse or hateful speech. Please use the Q&A function to pose questions to the presenter. The session moderator will read the questions to the presenter at the end of the session. Please also note that this session will be recorded and posted on the ICRC website. Thank you, Jill. Um, just before we begin, we want to acknowledge that Western University is located on the ancestral lands of the Anishinaabeg, Attawandaran, Lunapewak, and Haudenosaunee peoples on territory connected with, connected with the London Township and Sombra Treaties of 1796 and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum. As the Indigenous Education Network cautioned two years ago at the AERA conference in Toronto, land acknowledgements must resist becoming performative static scripts, but should instead be a call to action to reconsider what it means to be in good relations with Indigenous communities, lands, and waterways. Um, as education scholars, educators, researchers, and activists, we want to consider carefully the possibilities for education to redress the many past and present violences enacted in the name of settler colonialism and recognize that the acknowledgement of lands and waters is only a small part in engaging in just relations with Indigenous communities, lands, and waterways. Um, good morning and welcome to day two if you were here yesterday um, for day one of the, the symposium. And Welcome back, but if you are just joining us for the first time today, then, then welcome. Welcome to the Curriculum and Pedagogy for Uncertain Futures Symposium, uh, being presented by the Interdisciplinary Centre for Research in Curriculum as a Social Practice at the University of Western Ontario. My name is Corey Job, and I am a doctoral student uh, with the Faculty of Education at Western, and um, I'm just so happy that you're all here with us today. Uh, the ICRC is a research centre within the Faculty of Education at Western, comprised of both faculty and graduate student scholars who work in this collaborative community and university network to advance research in curriculum studies and to inform public policy and pedagogy in the 21st century. We're delighted to be coming together in this virtual space, and this symposium has been uh, curated as a multidisciplinary forum for reimagining the possibilities for curriculum and pedagogy in what is a particularly salient time for this kind of, of speculative thinking. As I was thinking about the introductory remarks, um, I was I was reading and thinking alongside cultural critic Olivia Lang, who uh, in the introduction to her recent book of essays, Funny Weather, she turns to the, the powerful speculative world making possibilities for, for art to both contextualize and to look uh, within and beyond the intensity of our collective times. And in her introduction, Lang writes, what I wanted most apart from a different timeline was a different kind of time frame in which it might be possible both to feel and to think, to process the intense emotional impact of the news and to consider how to react, perhaps even to imagine other ways of being. And so it's in the spirit of imagining what other ways of being are possible that we've convened this multidisciplinary lineup of presentations from education scholars, artists, graduate students, and community activists to consider the role of curriculum and pedagogy for uncertain futures. Responding to the times in which we live, a world shaped in part by the ongoing climate and waste crises, anti-Black, anti-Asian, and anti-Indigenous racism, the COVID-19 pandemic, and geopolitical instabilities, just to name a few, we have oriented this symposium around the following provocations that we invite you to think with as you listen to the presentations uh, over the next day. Um, first, we ask, what are the possibilities for inviting speculation into curriculum studies? In the name of what are curriculum and pedagogy enacted in response to the conditions of our times? How might curriculum scholars engage with Indigenous and Black feminist studies to contest humanism and coloniality in education? And finally, in the face of 21st century challenges, how are educators, curriculum theorists, and pedagogues rethinking curriculum and pedagogy? Uh, the format for each session will vary. However, each session will include time at the end for questions and answers between audience and presenters. And you are invited to use the Q&A function to share your questions with the moderators who will then facilitate this portion of the event. And we ask that you please keep our collective agreement in mind when participating in the Q&A. Uh, I would like to recognize the collective work of the Symposium Planning Committee comprised of graduate students and the director of the center, Tatiana Zakharova, Malvika Agarwal, Jill Dombrowski, Samia Javed, Sarah Hennessy, 
Courtney Niedig, Lisa Marie Gagliardi, and Veronica Pasini Um If you are joining in and sharing the conversation via social media, please feel free to tag any of the Symposium Planning Committee, uh, and any of the presenters if they're on social media, and to share your experiences using hashtag Uncertain Futures 2021 and hashtag Worlds to Come 2021. Uh, we are recording each session, as Jill mentioned, and the videos will be available on our website at www.icrc.uwoca.ca in the coming weeks. Um, and thank you. I know it's a bit repetitive if you've been here for the sessions. I have to say it three more times today, um, but there are many people joining in for, for different sessions. Um, so some of you, if you're hearing it for the first time, welcome again. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Hennessy, who will be introducing this session's presenter. Thanks, Corey. Um, I'm going to start our introduction and I'm going to hand it off to my colleague, Samia. Um, Ainara Alain is a 11 year old student um, from Southwestern Ontario. And I was lucky enough to have the pleasure of hosting Ainara in my early childhood class um, earlier this year at the Faculty of Education. And um, her voice, bringing her voice into our classroom with teacher candidates made an enormous impact on how we understand curriculum and how we understand our roles as teachers. So without further ado, Samia, I'm gonna hand it off to you to continue the introduction um, and we'll go from there. All right, thank you so much, Sarah. And good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us on this um, cloudy Friday morning. This is a recorded presentation from Ayanara Aline. Ayanara is 11 years old from Stony Creek in Hamilton. When Ayanara used to visit her library, she'd never see anyone in a book that looked like her. That's why she started Ayanara's book club, an Instagram account that highlights and spotlights books whose main characters are black and people of color. Ayanara uses her Instagram account to post reviews, recommendations, and interviews with authors in the effort to share diverse uh, stories with others. As of January 1st, she is Hamilton Public Library's first junior librarian in residence. She works with staff to diversify their catalog and shelves. This grade six student is currently working on a project called Diverse Readers, Future Leaders to help provide children in low income households with books She's also working on two um, children's books herself. Ayanara will be present to take her, your questions at the end of this presentation. And now can we have the presentation? Thank you for that great introduction. Thank you so much, Mrs. Sarah Hennessy and everyone at Western for asking me to be here today. It was such a great experience speaking with the teacher candidates early this year. And I am so grateful for the opportunity to speak with you all today. I'm gonna to admit that looking at all the speakers over the last few days, I was a little intimidated. <laughs> I am so honored to be here with you today and I hope I can contribute something meaningful to this event. Before we get into it, I would like to acknowledge that I'm speaking today from the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee. The city of Hamilton is situated upon the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, Haudenosaunee, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas. This land is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabek to share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Today, the city of Hamilton is home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, North America, and we recognize that we must do more to learn about the rich history of this land so that we can better understand our roles as residents, neighbors, partners, and caretakers. I am so nervous. Okay, well, my name's Ainara. You already know that. I run Ainara's Bookshelf, my bookstagram account, where I highlight books and authors of diverse cultures and backgrounds. I started Ainara's Bookshelf after I realized a lack of diverse books in my school library. The lack of diverse books isn't the root of the problem though. It's a symptom of a bigger issue. The lack of multicultural diverse approach to teaching and education. That seems like a bold statement coming from an 11 year old, but I don't mean it in a negative way. I just think as an Afro-Latina elementary kid, that my classmates from minority cultures, as well as the ones from European descent, would be better prepared for life 
in the future if diversity was a key element in our education. We live on a diverse planet. Canada is one of the most diverse countries on this planet right now, but that is also changing. Soon, half of newborns will be from a racial or ethnic minority. By 2050, the entire world will be a melting pot of race and culture. If we don't deal with the lack of understanding of diversity and culture, we won't be able to right the wrongs of the past. The way the system is currently set up is not preparing students for the real world or the world of work. The real world will be filled with diverse cultures. Technology could have you working remotely with a team member from anywhere in the world. We need to learn from an early age that our differences aren't strange or not normal, but just unique and different ways to do things. Teachers are usual on the front lines and it's important that you help us children navigate this world. The racial diversity of teachers most times does not mirror the racial diversity of the classroom. So it's almost certain that you will, even as a student teacher, be in a position to be teaching students that have a completely different religious, cultural, ethnic, or racial background than you do. I did not have a teacher of color until I was in grade four, and she has made a long lasting impact on my school life. Not just because of the color of her skin, but because of an empathy, understanding, and connection that I feel other teachers didn't take the time to achieve or didn't know how to. Shout out to Ms. Fernandez. <laughs> and again, this doesn't mean that teachers before or after her did not provide me with an education that allowed me to learn the curriculum and get good grades. I'm just saying that the confidence, empowerment, self-worth that she helps grow inside me are equally, if not more important tools to take into the world. I may not be speaking with you today if it wasn't for Mr. Fernandez. The fact that I'm here means that people are open to listening to this idea. But I also know that there will be some people who disagree. If you sighed or rolled your eyes at any point during what I was saying, then I beg you to just hear me out. I know. Diversity, 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 it's everywhere. Since last March, the awareness and push for diversity has been at an all-time high. Unfortunately, like most things, when something is in your face all the time, you tend to grow numb to it. I want people to not think that diversity is an attack on whiteness or my classmates of European descent. Diversity applies to you too. We have Little Italy, Portuguese District, Greek Town, etc. The goal of diversity is to embrace and understand each other. For example, Italian names are common in my school. If you have a name like Luca De Santis, it seems like a regular name because we are accustomed to it. Mohammed Javed, however, seems strange and other. Put Luca De Santis in a school with different demographics and his name is now different. The goal of diversity in education should be that neither are outlandish in either situation. We need to know how to understand. We need to know and understand our differences. I have given you the why. There are many people who are older than me and smarter than me can, that can give you the how. I will finish off with some examples and ideas I have about how we achieve diversity in education. Let's start with the three L's. Learn, listen, and love. Teachers need to learn about the cultures and ethnicities of their students. I'm not saying you have to be a walking encyclopedia, but you have a set number of students per year, and they change every year. If you take time to learn about the culture of the kids in your class, as the years go by, you will learn about many of them and be able to incorporate what you have learned in your teaching. Also, listen. Listen involves listening to students. Listen to how they want their names to be pronounced. Listen to their complaints about being harassed or bullied. Listen to how they learn. Love is basically the foundation of the other two. You need to love, understand, and emphasize with the mission. Otherwise, you won't be motivated to learn or listen. A real world example would be a story I read just a few days ago about a student right here in Ontario. His virtual class was using an app to make a class photo. These photos were made up of avatars that looked just like the students. This student, however, was Sikh, so he wore a Sikh head covering, which was not available in the app. 
the student, along with his, the help of his teacher, reached out to the company and asked for them to add Sikh head coverings along with other head coverings to be added to the program. Two months later, after receiving pictures from the students, the company released an entire line of turban and other head coverings for the avatars. The article quotes the student as saying, it's really inspiring. I'm really happy I was able to make a change. He said the fact that the company listened made him feel proud, happy, accepted, and adequately represented. Like I even made a change in the world. He said he hopes his story will help other kids like him wear their patkas with pride. This might seem silly. Without the three L's, it's just a hat and a nap. If you don't learn the meaning of the head covering, if you don't listen to the student's concerns, if you don't love diversity. This teacher not only taught him math, sciences, and punctuation, she taught him that he mattered. She taught him that he has a voice in this world. She taught him that he can affect change in this world. Together, they helped all the other Sikh kids in Ontario and even worldwide, given the availability of the app. I'm actually proud of myself for going so long without mentioning books, but books are an important part of teaching about diversity. Here are some tips or ideas about how you can use books. Books like My Name is a Song that celebrates the musicality of ethnic names. Like Eyes That Kiss in the Corners that celebrates the beauty of Asian ethnic features. Books like Genesis Begins Again, New Kid, Hair Love, For Black Girls Like Me, Ghost, Something to Say, are books that deal with race in a real world way that students and kids can relate to. These books aren't violent or historical, but deal with race, how kids themselves would encounter it in their day-to-day -day lives. Not all diverse books have to be about race, trauma, or civil rights. Choose books that are regular kids who might be of color doing normal things, where race or something race-related isn't the main focus. This could open the eyes of non-POC kids to the normalcy of minorities. Don't ignore the LGBTQ, trans, and disabled communities in the books. Lots of books have ensemble casts, a group of friends, or a party doing such and such. Look for diverse books, which kids can see the differences helping the team. Choose some nonfiction books, history, biography, that tell stories that aren't common. Kids might be tired of reading about Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks. But find a book about John Lewis or a graphic novel about the march and they will learn and see these characters while reading other stuff. I recently made a book list of 45 books with educator Sylvia Duckworth. You can find these lists on my Instagram as well as book lists on the Hamilton Public Library website. Another good idea would be a club. I created a club in fourth grade called Beauty in Culture. In this club, each meeting was run by a different student or a group of students if they shared a cultural background. They had a week to prepare, with the help of a teacher or myself, a presentation about their culture and an activity. For example, I made a presentation on Barbados and we all made crop over carnival masks as the activity. It's, this is an inclusive activity that all students can do that will also clue them in that everyone else's cultures is just as valid as their own. I think this is running too long and I have to leave time for questions. I want to thank you for having me and thank you for choosing to be teachers. My stepmom is a teacher and I understand the invisible long hours, the sometimes unreasonable expectations, and the lack of thank yous. So here's the thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All I ask is that you look past the curriculum and see that diversity is an essential part of learning and therefore an essential part of teaching. Kids will be more receptive to learning when they are comfortable in their own skin, their own name, comfortable with opening their ethnic lunch in the classroom and feel accepted and appreciated. Thank you so much for having me. Well, Inara, I'm going to start us off by saying thank you for your honesty, your joy, um, and your willingness to share. Um, I think it means an enormous amount 
certainly to me, but as an educator to hear voices of the students that we work so hard to teach. And this idea of learning and listening and loving, um, you did such an eloquent job of explaining what that means um, and how that feels in real life. And so I thank you for that. Um, so Samia and I have a couple of questions that we've got um, to start us off. Samia, do you wanna head in with the first question? Oh, you're muted. Uh, yeah, I thought so. <laughs> okay, there. Um, so Ayanara, um, my question to you would be, what would your top three recommendation of books be to teachers that they should have in their classrooms and elementary, again, your age group? Okay. Well, I think the top three books that teachers should have in their classrooms, in my opinion, would be Your Name is a Song by Jamila Tompkins Bigelow. Oh, I have it right here. Your Name is a Song. Um, Amari and the Night and Mari and the Night Brothers by B.B. Alston. Josephine Against the Sea. Oh, sorry. Wait, no. Let's go back. So, Your Name is a Song by Jamila Tompkins Bigelow. Genesis Begins Again by Alicia D. Williams. I love that book so much. That's middle grade. And then we have A Beautiful, Beautiful Me by Ashley Sarah Hinton. I think I love this book so much. And I think that every classroom should have that one. Okay. Um, you have a project that's Diverse Readers, Future Leaders. Um, tell us something about this project. Well, Diverse Readers, Future Leaders is a project that with the help of programs like Children's Aid Society and Big Brothers, Big Sisters, will be able to donate custom tailored books to underserved children and kids that live in low income households. I hope that through this, kids will not only see themselves represented and gain a love of reading, but also get the skills they need to learn and become a leader. It's kind of behind the scenes right now, and I have a lot on my plate, but I think that in summer, once I'm off of school, I'm going to start doing more with it and hopefully bring it forward a bit more. Do you have other class fellows who work with you on that project? Um, well, I, well, I work with my, my dad is helping me with this project, of course. And I think that we're gonna, we have lots of like contacts, especially through Instagram. I've had lots of teachers and educators and publishers who are willing to reach out and talk to me. So I think that with the help of them and with my dad, I think that it will work out and I hope that it will go smoothly. And so far it is. It's great how you view social media to be so powerful and use it to the, for the better and for just kind of helping everyone else and not social media in how most children your age would use it. So that's really powerful. The positivity, the, the outcome from, from what one good thought can do and, and how social media can multiply that and make it so much bigger. So that's, that's awesome. Um, you're also working on two books yourself. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Okay, well, I can't say too much, but they are about the two main topics in my bookshelf. Um, a love of reading and diversity. One is about loving reading and exploring books, and the other is about diversity and uniqueness. Okay. Oh, wow. When can we expect them to come out? No promises. So I'm not <laughs> going to say anything for that. Well, we'll be looking out for that. And I know Sarah will be looking out for that as well, <laughs> for <Yeah>. sure. <laughs> okay, and um, you're also um, Hamilton Public Library's first junior librarian in residence. Tell us about that. <laughs> yes, well, the Hamilton Public Library first reached out to me after I had won a 2020 Woman Who Rock Awards. After that, you know, we started talking and came up with the role of junior librarian in residence. I have been helping them add more diversity to their catalogs and the library in general. 
we have something really fun planned for the summer that I can't wait to share soon. But yeah, that's kind of how this started. And so far, it's been going really well. I've been able to do book lists for them. And it's just been really fun. Great. That's awesome. Um, any, any thoughts from you, Sarah? Oh, you're on mute now. <laughs> I'm on mute. We're starting to see some questions pop up. Um, so the first one is, um, Anara, what, what happens when teachers don't learn how to pronounce students' names? Yes, okay. So I do have personal experience with this, but it can just be really upsetting if you're not, well, I think most of the time the kid isn't gonna say how upset they are and they're just gonna keep correcting you, but it can just feel, I don't know, it just kind of feels hurtful and you kind of get frustrated and sometimes you get mad at yourself because, you know, you feel like you've got this name that nobody ha knows, you know, how to say properly. So I think that it's just really important and it helps us feel more comfortable in the classroom because, I don't know, it feels like a more safe environment and a more trustworthy environment if you have a teacher who really understands you and can actually say your name properly, especially if it's a harder one. And, and I mean, I feel like it's important to not always have to be reminded, I think. I think that, you know, you should clarify with the students, you know, if you don't understand, if you don't know how to pronounce it right away, ask the student. And if you still aren't 100% sure, don't guess later when you need to call on them in during class, you know, clarify with them. Okay, am I pronouncing it correctly? And then just make an effort to actually do it. And then it's good because it also impacts like the students of the classroom, I think, because then the students aren't actually saying it properly either. They're just saying what their teacher hears and that can also be frustrating. And then there's like name, making making fun of names and stuff. So I feel like it's really important just for the kid in general to feel like the classroom is actually like a safe and trustworthy environment. Excellent, thank you. Um, I remember when you came and visited um, with the teacher candidates in my classroom. And one of the questions that we had was around how books make you feel when you're in class as a student and what role they play aside from just the learning to read part of what a book does. And I wondered if you would share a little bit about what, what you think books do. What do books do? Yeah, well, I mean, I feel like when there's books in your classroom that, you know, you can see yourself in, it's, it just, it makes you feel seen. It makes you feel like you can go and do things. You know, if there's a book about a black girl becoming a lawyer, then, you know, other black girls will believe that they can become a lawyer too. And just learning about these things, learning about normal people that are of color that look like you achieving great things and achieving these things, you know, like reading about Obama and reading about how he became, you know, president. It's just, it can be really inspiring for you. And it helps with a lot with self-confidence, I think. And it just, I don't know, it just makes you feel seen and worthy and like you can actually achieve things. And, you know, that, you know, you see all these books about kids that don't look like you. And sometimes you question that can you only do these things if you look like they do? Can you only achieve these goals if you are, you know, like of European descent? Does, is that what it is? But when you see books that actually have people that look like you, you can see yourself. And I feel like that's what books do. Excellent, like being part of the conversation now. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Um, I have another question here. I have lots of people in the Q&A just saying how amazing your presentation was and um, how fantastic your work is. So I think it's important to share that. Um, I have a question here. Do you think that we have more work to do on fighting racism in schools? That's a big question. Whew, yeah, it is. Really <laughs> um, I definitely believe that there's still racism in schools, of course. It's not completely gone. It's just like, you know, the real world, there's still racism. You know, if 
people's parents, you know, are racist, it's most likely that kids will learn off of that, I think. So there's definitely still racism. It can be hard. I know I deal with a racist comment during school a couple years ago and the kid was suspended, which was good. So I think that it's just, it's like one of the three L's, right? You know, you need to listen to the students' complaints about, you know, being bullied and, you know, see, look into it. Like if somebody's being bullied because of their head covering, that might not mean much to you because you don't know what it's like to have a head covering, but if it's important to them and it has a special meaning to them, you need to listen to that and you need to understand it fully, see what it means to the students and how they're affected by it and how their mental health is affected by it. So I think that there's definitely racism, but I feel like teachers especially can help with that. I think just, yeah, just listening, just listening and watching out especially because I know sometimes kids will be nervous to you know, share anything towards his teacher. So I think also looking out for it, making sure that the kids are okay. You know, if you see something, if you see somebody, you know, acting strangely or, you know, something might be happening between two kids being bullied, I think that you should take the time to check up on them and not wait for things to get worse. I think that you should check on them, just make sure that they're doing okay, ask if there's anything you can do. And if they say that they're fine, then that's good. But if not, then make sure that you're taking, making the extra effort to actually, you know, stop it and make sure that it's actually being stopped. Not a, just an apology in the hallway, but actually a stopping and knowing that there will be consequences if you continue this. Excellent. Thank you. That was a big question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have one in the Q&A for you. It says, uh, what has been your learning about yourself and others as you have journeyed through these initiatives? How have your values been affected? Sorry, can you repeat that? I was like, <laughs> you bet. Well, we could start. We could start with the first one. What has been your learning about yourself and others as you have journeyed through these initiatives? So I'm thinking about, you know, Inara's bookshelf. I'm thinking about being um, in residence with the library, your project at school, et cetera. Well, I think that learning about different cultures and learning about different things, it's definitely been fun. It's definitely been really educating. You know, you learn more things and then you can connect with people on a different level, which is why like education, learning about different like cultures in education is also important because then when you go and actually speak to these people, you can connect with them on another level, right? You can understand them and understand where they're coming from, you know, like learning. I didn't really know what the meaning of a Sikh head covering or what head coverings were, but when you learn about them, then you understand, oh, okay, this is really important, right? And when people, when somebody's doing this, it's because it has a special meaning to them, right? And I think doing that club, Beauty and Culture, was really interesting because it was not only helping the other kids in the group learn about, you know, the student's culture, but it was also helping that the student who was working on the presentation learn about their culture, you know? There's times where you don't fully know everything about your culture or you're not really sure about it. And seeing some of the kids actually like learn and discover things about, you know, their background and the places where, you know, their parents came from and stuff. I feel like it's really interesting and, can, and it can be really fun. And just doing the activities adds another, you know, level of interest and it helps the kids, you know, actually learn more, I think. So it was really fun to do that. And, you know, it helps me myself learn about other cultures too, right? When you're helping these other kids. And I feel like everybody's learning, you know, I'm learning, even the teachers who are helping them are learning, the student themselves are learning, and then the rest of the group is learning. So it's just a bunch of learning experience and it can be really fun sometimes. Yeah, I think it's an interesting way to exist in the world to position, if everybody positioned themselves as co-learners, right? So one of the hats I might wear as an educator, but another hat that I'm always wearing is a co-learner. I'm learning with you. Um, we're learning together. Um, so I have another question for you here. Um, 
It says, Inara, you talked about the problems with, and I'm using quotes here, what is normal? Um, that when we create the normal, we also create the abnormal and the different. Mm -hmm. And one of our um, speakers yesterday um, was mentioning this concept of refusing the normal. And I wonder what you think about that idea going forward of refusing the concept of normal. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that normal should be a specific type of person, if you know what I mean. I think that normal should be being yourself fully. I think that that's what normal should be because why are you trying to be somebody else's normal? You be your normal and everybody can be their normal or just have no normal. Everybody's unique. So nobody's normal. I think that normal is a weird term because like, especially when you're talking about people because everybody's different right? Nobody, no two people are the same. That's what the whole world is, right? So having this normal and trying to be normal, your normal should just be you being yourself to the fullest. I think that that's what it should be, feeling comfortable in your own skin, feeling able to be your true self. That should be normal. I'm normal because I, you know, I love myself and I'm actually who I want to be and I'm not changing myself just to fit in with another group right? People have similar interests. And if everybody's being their self, people will find people with similar interests all the time, right? So if we're just true to ourselves, and, you know, we actually believe in ourselves and our cultures and, you know, things that make us us, then we will find people who are just like us, right? So I think that normal, no normal should be a thing, because I don't know, I feel like there's no normal, really. So yeah. I feel like we could start a t-shirt company that said, no normal, I refuse normal. <laughs> I mean, like, I put it on your list of books that you want to write. There's no normal. Exactly. Excellent. Samia, do you have any questions you want to add in here? Um, no questions, just just a thought that it is so important what um, Ayanara said uh, about the, the normal or the not so normal. And I think as educators, it is our job to provide that environment or create that environment in our classrooms to support um, everyone to be themselves, to be their best selves um, and not to kind of uh, be try to be somebody else. And so creating that safe environment, um, kind of including everybody, including everybody's voice, all of the things that you said in your presentation, the, the thing about um, the Sikh boy and his head and his um, headgear, um, that story just gives me goosebumps because what an impact that teacher made, not on just that one Sikh child, but all of the other 20, 25 kids in that class that everybody was now writing a letter to this company saying, you need to include this and growing, moving forward, those 20, 25 children are also going to stand up for everybody who thinks or seems invisible or doesn't have a voice, help them find their voice um, and be their own normal. So wonderful, wonderful thought provoking ideas for, for us, Ayanara. Thank you so much. I have another question here. Um, so Ayanara, a lot of us here, myself included, um, teach and work with very young children. Um, in childcare, and we know that you think a lot with your brother. Um, any suggestions for early childhood educators? Any suggestions, like book suggestions? Yeah. Book suggestions, yeah, I have tons of book suggestions. I mean, yes, my, I have my brother, and he, he likes reading bedtime books, and he always wants a book before bed and I also have a little sister who loves books and flipping through books so I definitely have a lot I think that your name is a song this one especially I love this book so much it's really inspiring and I think this is a great one to have in a in a classroom you know especially for young kids I think that this is really important because it is showing the musicality of your name and if a young kid isn't too, you know, positive about their name because, you know, most of the kids in their class, their names don't sound like that. 
I think that this book is definitely really inspiring for them. And I think that it's definitely a book that every kid should read. Eyes That Kiss in the Corner. This book, I also love it. I recommended this one also. I was saying that. But yes, this one talks about, you know, your ethnic features and to love them and the beauty in them. So this one, again, is another one. Beautiful, Beautiful Me is amazing. I think that this book is definitely in, is definitely in the top three for books that you should have in a, like a young classroom. I love it so much. And it's great for everybody. You know, it doesn't only talk about people of color, but it talks about different people, right? It talks about, like I was saying in my video, you know, people, there's diversity applies to everybody, right? So I think that this book also really brings that out. So definitely, definitely, definitely this one. And yeah, there are many books. I'm smart. I'm blessed. I can do anything. That book is also is amazing. And I just think that there are so many. There are so many with different, you know, kids of color and kids of color beside people who aren't of color, right? Just like the groups, right? Find groups that are diverse, groups that have everybody in it. So I think that yeah, just find books like that and the books like these. So this one is less of a question and more of um, um, an invitation. So one of my professors is attending today and has posted um, in the Q&A saying, hi, Inara, my four-year-old daughter, Sienna, is with me now and she loves your talk. And I wonder if there's any book you would like to say, Sienna, I hope you read this with your mummy. Hmm. Pick one for her. Huh? Pick a book for her. All right. So let's see. Okay. Let's go with this book. Ambitious Girl. Excellent. So is there any chance you might read aloud to us? Would you read the book to us? Sure. Which one do you want me to read? You want me to read this one? Yeah, you bet. All right, sure. Ambitious girl. Great, okay. <laughs> okay, let's go. Let me find a good position that I can show the pages. All right. Okay. Don't let anyone tell you who you are. You tell them who you are. When I grow up, I hope to be all the things I can see in a world that's changing fast and slow, a world I'm only beginning to know. I want to go, go, go out the gate, but sometimes all I hear is wait. And if I try to resist, if you're to that or you're to this, those words may try to dim my light. But mommy says that words passed down can build me up to new heights. Standing tall like a soaring tower, I am valued. I am loved. I have purpose, hope, and power. Ahead of me, sisters, aunties, mothers have opened so many doors. Grandma says, you may be the first someday, but don't be the last. Make space for more. No one can tell me who I am or who I'm meant to be. Auntie says, what has always been is all there's able to see. I'll take my time and claim my place and show this world and show the world this is me. Persistent means I won't give up. Assertive means I won't back down. Confident means I believe in me. Proud means cheer for us, the world around. Ambitious means all of that and more. 
I have goals, but I'm not keeping score. Ambitious girls, we get things done. If life's a race, we're ready to run. If we fall, we get back up. And if we fail, it's a chance to disrupt. No to that or to this, we'll stop what's inside us from flowering. From now on, when I hear to that or to this, I won't mind, it's empowering. I'll take up space, I'll shout if I please, I'll laugh and I'll play and I'll jump at the sun. I'll wear the words thrown at me and I won't take no from anyone. I'm not afraid to make some noise. I am more than ready to use my voice. Because there's no to that or to this when it comes to being ambitious. The end. Well. On behalf of everybody, I'm going to say thank you for reading aloud. I think, especially these days, um, we can all use some of that joy of listening to somebody read a story to us and read a story that carries great meaning. Um, I hope Sienna out there, I hope she enjoyed story time. <laughs> and thank you for doing that, Inara. Um, Let's just see, we may have some more questions. Um, let's have a look. Oh, well, my professor says, thank you so much. So there you go. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, when encouraging learning about different cultures and practices and bringing that into the classroom, what would be your advice to educators to make sure they don't cross over into cultural appropriation? Well, I think that learning about different cultures and, you know, different, just different cultures in general and different backgrounds, I think that it's important if you're doing it based off of children that are in the classroom and you're trying to, you know, share the backgrounds and cultures of kids that, you know, are in your classroom. I think that you should also ask the students, ask the students what their life is like, how, you know, their culture, what their culture is like, how they do different things if their things are different, right? I think that you should make it more engaging. And I think, you know, when you're doing research for these things, I think that you should definitely you know, be careful. I don't, I'm not 100% great with this, you know, subjects, of course, like I said in my video, you know, there are many people who can share more with you. But I just think making sure that you triple check, you know, triple check that your facts are correct, because you know, this is a topic that if you get things wrong, it might, you know, affect the kid or kids that you know are from this culture and it might make them feel like you know that they're not being represented or seen properly so yeah i think definitely asking the kids as well will be helpful and you know verifying with the kids what is right and what is wrong will be very helpful for them and if especially if you're sharing it with the entire class it'll definitely be very educational and very yeah like making the kids feel seen i feel like that is what would happen if you did it, which is good. But yeah, just, you know, triple checking and then actually asking the students for their advice and their, their words. Excellent. I know talking about cultural appropriation is a big topic. Um, I sort of felt like one of the things I might do is to go back to what you said about learn, listen, and love. And that before anything comes into my classroom, what do I need to learn? How do I need to listen? And is it coming with love? Um, and I mean, that's one of my big takeaways today, aside from the fact that um, I might replay this video just to have you read a story to me before bed. <laughs> because I think we all need more of that. Yeah. Um, I'm just looking for our questions. Um, Oh, here's one. 
So four-year-old Sienna, um, her mom has typed back, I love you and you read so well. Oh, thank you. Yay, Sienna, thanks for participating. Um, what book, here's a question. Um, what book do you recall that encompassed your passion for books and racial identity? Because they're a book that came to you that you go back to all the time um, that brings your book passion and racial identity to you? Well, I, well, definitely for my book passion, I think Amari and the Night Brothers mm -hmm. was such an incredible book. That book, it made me go into com a completely different world and it was just so fun. And, you know, seeing Amari, who is, you know, the same age as me and who, you know, is Black and looks like me going and she already deals in the real world. So there's a magic world and then there's the world that we know, right? In the world that we know, she, you know, got bullied because she was of color, right? And, you know, she had to deal with, with issues that, you know, normal black girls have to go through. But then she goes into this new magical world where you would expect that things would be different and you, you know, everything would be just magical and fun. But then she's also different there, right? Because she has a different kind of magic. She has, she, her magic is supposed to be, you know, bad and, you know, not good, right? But she wants to change that. And just seeing her face all these problems, I definitely remember feeling so inspired because she's going through all this stuff and yet and all these people are turning against her and being mean to her and awful to her but she's still taking making that extra effort to go and help them and prove herself even though she shouldn't have to right so I think that that book was just incredible and I mean I would read it over and over again that was the first book that I read that you recommended after we after you visited my class um and i have since ordered more than a few copies for uh people in my life because it really is an amazing recommendation and it really does it changes you the books have that amazing power um so i'm looking at our time and i'm also looking at the questions and comments and I'm not sure if I can even come close to summarizing, except to say that I think what you've done today and bringing your voice and your courage and your enthusiasm and your knowledge and your joy um, to us today, um, as one, one of the comments um, somebody posted was that you've reinvigorated us. So those of us in teaching, um, you know, there are good days and there are bad days, and sometimes it's hard. Um, and I think hearing your voice is bringing back some of that um, joy and energy in the work that we do. And so I want to say thank you. Um, I genuinely appreciate, as always, um, what you do and owning your voice and the willingness that you have to share your voice. It means a lot. Um, you've certainly changed me. I certainly am still learning with you. Um, and so I would encourage, um, I would encourage you to keep it up. <laughs> and if you have any last questions for us, um, and yeah. Any, any last words you would like to share? I just want to say thank you so much. I'm glad that, you know, all these people that aren't here actually wanted to listen to me and hear what I had to say and, you know, learn more about this topic. And, you know, just seeing that teachers like you and Tamia are going to go out and listen and, you know, share these things, it makes me feel very heard and seen and I'm very glad that I could, you know, actually help and make a difference in even if it's just a couple classrooms that kids of color and will, you know, see diversity and see themselves and 
hopefully make school an even safer space. So thank you so much for having me and listening to me today. Excellent. And with that, um, thank you, Inara. Thank you, Samia. Um, I'm going to let the audience know that we have one, two, three more speakers today, and I hope you will stay with us. And we'll be back for our next session from 12 to 1 with Anna Binta Diallo. And so I hope everybody has a chance to get a tea or a coffee or a breath of fresh air. And um, I hate to say goodbye, Ainara, but um, thank you so much for coming. Thank you.